Welcome to the D&D Fitness Radio Podcast, brought to you by your hosts, Don Saladino from New York City and Derek Hansen from Vancouver, Canada. It's funny, Derek, so I got hooked up with Kyle Shea years ago. I think Kyle's a Czech practitioner, isn't he? Yes, so Kyle's level four Czech. Yes. Okay. So one of my closest, so uh, Derek, Rob Yang's a four chat or I'm sorry, was a four chat. And um, I, I was? guess was, well, <laughs> I, I, I guess is, I mean, technically, I guess, you're, I guess you're never going to stop doing, he just doesn't teach for check anymore. Oh, okay. Okay. I don't think so. I got hooked up with Kyle somehow, I think in that inner circle and a couple, I know a couple of uh, check fours and I think years ago when um, I started working with TPI and, and Greg Rose and I were kind of talking about overspeed, underspeed training. And um, this was the first product. Uh, the super speed clubs was the first product I've actually ever seen that pretty much work. <laughs> <laughs> because, um, they pretty much nailed the science when it comes down to, you know, how much weight are you supposed to go over the golf club or, or you know, beneath the golf club. And, and the percentage is really small. I think it's something like, Michael, you and you tell me, was it like 10%? Yeah, no, we, we kind of found that like the 20% light side, which was a really common thing, I would say, out in the industry and some other sports w- was okay. And we just found that if you get too heavy, you completely defeat the purpose of overspeed training. So we have some cool stuff we can talk about on that as far as I think we've started to try to tell the story or at least explain the whole concept of overspeed versus overload training. And I think a lot of the early systems tried to combine those things two together. So right. you look at overspeed training of making things move faster to neurologically like reset how fast your brain expects your body to respond overload training being something where we're trying to activate more motor units in the body. So if you can separate those two types of training, I think you can actually get much bigger results, better results overall. Um, predecessors to what we've done have always tried to do those two things together. Uh, so we separate that out now and, uh, I think we've, we've seen some much better results because of it. I mean, a, a lot of our listeners out there aren't as familiar as say we are on the uh, actual topics, but um, you know, I, I think what I, I want them to understand and maybe you guys can explain a little bit is that this is not like, Oh, well, if it's uh, if a golf club's a lot heavier, like, you know, I played collegiate baseball, we used to swing weighted bats. I mean, you could really screw someone up. Oh, you, absolutely. Can really, you can really take their swing speed in the reverse direction. Can you get into detail a little bit on that? Yeah. Now, uh, do you want to go into this now or is it, are we going to start the episode or how do you want to do it? already started. <laughs> oh, we're in. We're no, in. We can, uh, yeah. So why don't you, um, yeah, why don't we, why don't we, why don't we talk about that? What we're going to do is we're going to give a little bio on you guys later on. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, the weighted side of it, you know, and again, I don't want to go out and say that there is no use for like a weighted bat or a weighted golf club or anything like that. Like there are certain things that that can help players improve, uh, specifically on the sequencing side. I think those help players understand what it feels like to sequence properly. However, whenever you're doing speed training, the whole, you know, the main concept there is that you're going to be moving faster than you normally do in that motion. So when you get something that's heavy, that's going to neurologically slow down the rotational velocity of the segments of your swing. It's going to slow down how fast that ending club speed or bat speed is going to be. And in just a very, you know, very few amount of those swings, your brain remembers that slower speed and then literally will, will, try to recreate that even with a lighter object. Um, Again, that's kind of the opposite of overspeed training. That would be slowing you down with a heavier weight. Um, The overspeed training side, you know, we're always using lighter things to make the body move faster and have your brain remember that faster response speed. That's kind of where I was going into that difference in overspeed and overload training. Those heavy objects could be used as an overload training device, We've just found that it's actually more effective to do overload training away from that specific motor program. So um, if I'm going to do overload training with a golfer, I might have a golfer throwing, you know, I use weighted balls and have them throwing and using that motion. Um, Heck, I mean, you could even just do stuff in the gym. You could lift weights and activate more motor units and then have them immediately go into a speed training routine. And with that neurological, like those motor units just kind of firing throughout their body, um, you can see better activation of those motor units in that actual motor program um but again that would be overload training over speed training you got to move faster 
Yeah. And, and Michael and the, I, I, like I, I coached sprinters for like 20 plus years, 30 years. And the analogous sort of method would be like pulling a sled or running downhill. And in both cases, you can overdo it and create problems. And I, I was just thinking about if you're moving something in an arc and it's got some length to it, I think you could probably get into a lot of trouble if you overdo it in terms of like centrifugal forces and all that sort of thing. Oh, absolutely. That was one of the main design changes that we did when we developed Super Speed Golf versus some of those heavier type items that were out there beforehand is we really had to make a big difference in like in a weighted ball program, for example, like you can get a weighted ball that's five times as heavy as a baseball and you can still create pretty good arm speed with that baseball. However, because you've got a 45 inch arc width on the club, the amount of resistance change for every tiny bit of change in weight in that club is is much greater than when the ball's in your hand. So we actually found that only going to like 5% heavier than the player's driver was plenty of increase in resistance to get the effect of, I would say the permanency effect of the training by having that, that it's a little heavier than the player's driver. But even in our training protocols, when you go through that, if you measure every swing that you would do with the light club, the medium club and the heavy club, that uh, when you get to that heavy club, because you've done that reset, that neurological reset with those two light clubs, players on average are still swinging that red club about 12% faster than their normal swing speed, even though it's a little bit heavier. And that was why we decided on that, that weight is uh, when we got more than about eight to 10% heavier than the player's driver, um, depending on the player, we'd always see the swing speed slow down and we'd always see the rotational velocity in the segment slow down if you look at it on 3D too. And that was, and you were just, you were measuring that using like a, a track man or a specific launch monitor. What would you do? Would you actually, would, would, would that research take place in the same session or was it something where you were using, you know, clubs that were say 30% heavier and then putting them on the launch monitor. Like, like, what did you guys use for the research? So we actually did those back at our uh, our golf academy in in Chicago um, before we sold it. So we actually were were doing testing with different groups, and we had different weighted clubs. So we had. I think we went up to 50% lighter than the player's driver and we went up to about 25% heavier than the player's driver. And what we did is we actually broke the different, uh, broke the subjects up into groups where like this group would do the super light one, the medium one and the super heavy one. And this group did the light one and the medium one and the slightly heavy one. And we had four different main groups there. And what we found is that every time we had somebody swing in a club that was more than eight to 10% heavier than their driver, we saw a slowing down of those speeds. So that's why we kind of tossed that out um, as an optimal way to do overspeed training because we don't want to slow people down. We want them always moving faster than their normal speed. Um, we also found that if we got way too light, so if we got on the really light side, the group that was using like the super ultra light club, um, when we actually measured that so if we measured that on 3D, so we actually took dry swings on 3D and looked at how fast they're, they're moving. Um, we started to see that like the lower body segments didn't really need to activate anymore. So they're effectively, they're using a different motor program. They're not using the same sequence of motion when they get too light because there's no need to do it. You know, your brain kind of goes to path of least resistance. So we tested a lot of that on 3D. Um, with dry swings in the clubs. The other thing that we did that I thought was really cool is we did before and after testing. So we did like uh, before speeds hitting a ball, after speeds hitting a ball. And then we also tested the actual speeds of the players swinging each of the individual super speed clubs throughout all of those training sessions and recorded all of it. So we really had a, a pretty good like startup R and D mountain of data to, or the reasons that we picked the weighting distribution that we did. Um, it certainly wasn't arbitrary. That was about a year and a half worth of testing that we went through to find what we felt to be optimal on that side. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, one question I had was, uh, I guess it's about the timing of the use and when do you do it? Uh, obviously there could be a potentiation effect if you do it right before you go and say, go driving. Um, but what are the implications for um, like long-term training in terms of development and, and retaining those qualities? Have you guys mm -hmm. kind of studied that? Because uh, obviously you can get an immediate effect, but then it'll fade away. But how do you keep that effect, I guess, or keep that quality? Yeah, so over to me. Um, so um, basically you're going to be training. You want to keep this stuff at low intensity and low frequency, just like you would any other speed and power training. 
um, as rega with regards to when you want to do it. You want to do it like before you do a strength workout. You don't want to do it after because you'll be tired. So you want to do it when you're most neurologically fresh. Now, with regards to um, you know results over time, it's a little bit different how we would train a baseball player to how we would train a golfer because obviously a golfer, uh, when they, they do it before they play and they get on the first tee, their yardages are going to be a hell of a lot further for the first three holes. And, you know, keeping um, your yardages consistent is important to success in the golf game. Whereas mm. in baseball, you want them to be swinging, you know, as fast as they can when they're on the, on the bat, when they're batting. So it doesn't matter. You can use it as a warm up before they play to, to peak their speeds right before they get up there and hit. Um, so it's a little bit of a different approach. And um, with regards to like, um, you know, maintaining speed, if you're, you know, you want to hit a, a phase in your season where you don't want to do as much speed training only one session a week is enough to maintain what you already gained um so that can sort of put you into a plateau phase um but you know uh, we have several different protocols online that gradually advance add reps add duration um and add different challenging positions that challenge the different um areas of biomechanics that help produce speed so um, they're all on our website, superspeedslugger.com under training. So you can find our timeline of protocols, how long you should spend on each one um, and our recommendations for best practices as well. Yeah, so, Sorry about uh, that. No, no, I was just going to jump in and just one other thing. I think the pattern of what you expect to see in a player is really, um, we've seen a very consistent pattern in, in what players get as results on, on the training. So generally speaking, as you said, you're going to get a jump in this type of thing right after you do it the first time. Um, what we'll see is on average, if we measure actual skill effective speed in golf, we see about a 5% jump after the first session. Baseball, we see about actually a 6 to 8% jump after the first session. It's actually a little bit more. Um, tennis, we're actually seeing a little bit, you know, uh, right in the middle there, right around that 6% jump uh, as well. We then see, if you were to measure the before speed, you know, when you're hitting a ball um, after every or before every session and then measure the after speed after every single session over the course of time, we would see that um, the before speed would gradually kind of creep up to whatever that initial jump speed was. Uh, it takes about six to eight weeks for those two to then become about the same. So we kind of look at this in a three phase cycle. There's a jump, then there's about a six to eight week normalization phase. Uh, and then we'll enter into a plateau phase. That plateau phase for, so it varies for different athletes, but we'll see that last anywhere from about six weeks to about three months. And then we'll see a secondary jump. And that secondary jump is usually a little bit smaller. Um, we have the most data on the golf side, but on average, we see that to be about three to three and a half percent. Then another like six to eight weeks for that to normalize, then another plateau phase. Theoretically, that pattern, um, like a lot of other types of like speed training in the gym, kind of happens uh, forever with diminishing returns on how big the jumps are and increasing times or lengths of those plateau phases. You know, I have, I, I have a question. I'm not sure if either of you can, can answer this, but I've been kind of a little infatuated with the amount of effort being put into a swing or a, th uh, or, um, or a, a pitcher's throw um, just, just to give an example during, during a game. And it's just something that coaches never really speak about. I know in a lot of the TPI junior programs, they're talking about kind of variability with sports and movements and that, how there's a specific frame, there's a specific age where you got to just be going out there and if you're swinging a golf club, swing it as hard as you can. But, you know, take pitchers, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, I think this year I'm a big Met fan. I think they said three of the hardest throwers in the National League were all Mets. I think it was okay. something like I think it was Noah Syndergaard, Jake DeGrom, and Zach Wheeler. Yep. I don't know if it was in that order. I'm always curious to know how much are these athletes leaving in the tank? So when you're looking at, um, you know, one of the longer guys on tour or when you're looking at one of the fast, faster throwers in the major leagues, is there a correlation on how much effort they're putting into on each throw or each swing? Is it like 90% max effort? or are, are there, Is there any data that you guys have on that? Yeah, I think – it's hard to collect data on that just because it's hard to really know what exact peak is for those athletes. Um, 
I can say this though, like the traditional adage in the golf world that, you know, you're going to just kind of swing at about 80% is completely bogus. Yeah, um, that's bullshit. That, yeah, that absolutely. Like, I mean, your guys on the PGA tour, um, when they're standing up with a driver on the tee box, like there's very little left in the tank afterwards. Now, I mean, is there a little bit of space for some adrenaline and they could probably touch it to another gear by another percent or two, maybe, but no, we find that most of the time, at least those golfer athletes, and again, this is something that I would say is contradictory to what's taught mostly in the golf world. Most of those athletes are, are functioning, especially with a full swing shot with a longer club, pretty close to 100% of what they got. Right. Um, again, you know, it's, it, it's hard to say that with evidentiary backing for 100% certainty, but you know, they're not swinging easy on the tee. Let's just put it that way. That, oh, that's total BS. Absolutely not. And it's like, I, I guess it's specific to the athlete too. I mean, you got certain golfers out there that, that I watch and it's just, it's silky smooth. It's easy. And then I went out, I was fortunate enough to be able to play 18 holes with Rory McIlroy um, about a year ago at national. And I asked him to lean on one and he leaned on it and it didn't look that much different than what he was doing all day. So, oh, you know, absolutely. It, you know, silky smooth, it. silky smooth and a hundred percent of their athleticism. Those two are, I, I would say th those two could be the same thing. Like a lot of times what you see with tour players is because they're so functionally stable. They're so strong in their lower bodies. They're able to, they're able to control that extremely high amount of force that's going through their body that their swing looks extremely smooth. And, you know, it looks like they're swinging easy, but what I'm saying there is that even though it looks that way, the amount of energy that's going through that is extremely high. And I think when you apply that to amateur players, it's incredibly important because amateur players go out there and they try to look like it's being really smooth and they're putting like, 30% of the same power that's going through a PGA Tour player. I just always wondered if there was some correlation, like if you take a senior guy like Colin Montgomery or you take a, a Rory McIlroy and you look at, you know, if, if you did get him, get him on a launch monitor and you did say swing normally and then, you know, turn to them and you're holding a gun to your head and say, swing this club as hard as humanly possible. I wonder if the differential, if the, if the differential is within some percentage of, I'm wondering if that's yep. something – accurate from player to player that's, yeah, that's I, mean, I, I think I think it would vary between player to player I think some players do just because they've learned that to swing slightly more conservatively um, I think uh, most of you guys though that are coming out on tour now especially your younger generation are real close to 100 percent I mean as a coach what I tell my players is that I want them to swing as fast as they can swing stably and you know so as fast as their body can stabilize and we're going to work on trying to make their body more stable and able to stabilize more speed but you know I, I think to the practical point on this I think most amateur golfers are no, nowhere close to swinging as aggressively as they should be um, I think most of them are trying to overly control the golf swing and that's just a recipe not only for shorter distance but also you know more issue with dispersion you know it's just bad when you're trying to be overly controlled in your golf swing everything's gonna go gonna go south yeah like i i mean it's really about this perception piece of like what is 100 percent effort and i would think my 100 percent effort swing a golf club because i suck right uh would be like 30 percent output whereas 100 percent effort for a pro would be closer to 100 percent output right so it's it's very hard to measure like you said my question is if you're working with somebody who's say a novice or less experienced or lower level versus a somebody who's at the top of their game and winning tournaments, what is the approach with this type of weighted uh, versus a lighter? Because I know at least in sprinting, if I take somebody who's like not that good at running and we overload them, they get better. Mm -hmm. But if I take Usain Bolt and overload them, I could break them. So yep. what differences do you have? Yeah, well, I guess the first piece is there is because we're our our system's built with such a tight range around the player's actual club is that there's not a lot of overloading. There's not a, you know, there's, there's not a lot of variance from their club that we really don't see a lot of issue from a mechanical standpoint. Um, so that would be kind of the first piece I would say. I'd say, you know, from the side, if we're kind of staying on this tune of just, you know, what we're trying to do, I think it's a huge benefit for amateurs because it, it just, makes them work more athletically like what's a major piece of the training is just helping people become more athletic in the way they're swinging a golf club and getting out of that getting out of their own way with all these little bits they're trying to do and just become better athletes um, on the course 
Um, so that's a huge piece in the game there. Um, I think for your for your tour players, you know, there's some of that. I think there's also just the raw piece of that neuromuscular training that we're doing here where they have a little bit more speed that their body's capable of that they're not accessing. Um, and we are just helping them access that speed that they've already got. Um, only other sure. piece I would talk to on that end. Uh, go ahead, Don, if you want to add no, something. Sorry, sorry. So, um, I was going to ask quickly. Um, how does how does the training affect mechanics? I mean, that's something I never really hear anyone discuss. Um, you know, I think of someone becoming faster mm -hmm. as um, I don't want to say someone who's more necessarily efficient, but who's more athletic. Sure. If you develop more speed, you're technically more. You're you're a better athlete, in my, in my opinion. Is there any correlation between the improvement of speed and the improvement of actually being able to get a player? And, we're, and we're, I know we're using golf as an example, but this probably applies. I mean, this obviously applies to all different sports, but do you Absolutely. find that with the improvement of speed, that's actually allowing people to get in a position a little bit easier? So I would say yes. And let me just kind of explain why. Um, we don't directly claim that, you know, our overspeed training products are going to help you with swing mechanics, mainly because of, uh, I would say, my main belief as a coach that, my goal as a coach is to help somebody get better with the absolute least amount of input that I can possibly give them. So like gold standard on that is if I can help somebody improve eight different things about the mechanics of their golf swing and never even tell them in the first place that there was an issue, you know, that's gold standard in coaching in my opinion. So we give one simple cue in our protocols and that's basically to make that club move as fast as you can down through the hitting zone. Right now, depending on where a player starts and we've done a lot of research on this actually and we've actually broken it into a model that we call the speed pyramid so the speed pyramid starts with the base of how that player interacts with the ground so this is all your ground reaction force ground force mechanics pressure all of that area right middle tier of the the speed pyramid is going to be your rotational sequencing and kinematics there's going to be a relationship between how fast the different segments of your swings are ro or is rotating and then the top piece of the pyramid is going to be your wrist mechanics lag, essentially applying torque and force to the club to be able to actually get all that speed that we've stolen through that system to the ball and hit the ball, right? So we look at it on that area. Now, those three things work and they work together for every player in every swing that they make down to even when they're like hitting chip shots, okay? So you can measure that those things all work in all the shots in the swing. But if we take a high power swing, like a golf swing or, you know, baseball or tennis serve or whatever it might be, um, it depends on where the player's starting as far as what the player might have as far as the strengths of, of their speed and power production and where they may have weaknesses. Okay, so let's take a player, for example, that doesn't use the ground very well and is relying primarily on like rotational sequencing and trying to lag the club to get speed, but didn't get any of that initial kinetic energy stolen from the ground that we know is so important that the best players in the world tend to get a lot of that type of uh, piece in their, in their speed and power production. We kind of hide things in throughout all of our training protocols that work on that. So we have different drills like our step change of direction drill or uh, back step drill, double step drill, heel stomp drill, all of these different drills, you know, in a major way work on helping a player use the ground better in their golf swing, get more energy out of the ground. So if a player is very deficient there, uh, absolutely, they're going to improve how they use the ground because we're doing like four or five drills on that without ever really telling them that they were doing drills for ground reaction forces. And the same thing with rotational sequencing, the same thing with lag. All of these protocols that we have and the drills inside the protocols work on those mechanical elements of the swing that greatly affect speed and power production. Well, Derek, um, Derek, this question is actually for you because – uh, listen, speed is speed, right? I mean, you're, you've made a career on making people incredibly fast. Is this, uh, it, when, as he's talking about going a little heavier and a little lighter, in overspeed and underspeed, is this any different than putting someone on a very minor incline or a very minor decline and having them train those characteristics? Or is this, you know, is, yeah. is that not yeah. going to increase the speed yeah. of the room? I think in any of those cases um... – it is a very slight variation. It's very, very slight, right? And you're trying to get some sort of mechanical improvement out of that, like, and without deviating too far from your, your optimal technique, right? So um, when I see people pull, pushing like a heavy sled, I get concerned because I'm looking at ground contact time. And 
if they're on the ground too long, they lose that elastic response, right? That you're trying to get that reflex. And I would think it's the same with hitting a ball and, um, you know, and, and then you don't want to hurt somebody like that's, that's the huge thing a lot of the time. And I think, um, even in baseball, I think there were a couple of studies and I don't know if it was like Tom house or uh, something like that, who said, listen, just have some small degree of variability. And usually that will, whether it's up above or below the weight of the baseball, and that's usually going to create enough of a stimulus for you to you know, move forward with your velocity. So I, I assume it's the same here, Michael. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's exactly the same. And one little thing in there, I got to throw in this little tangent. Let's get rid of that word under speed. That doesn't exist. So it's over speed training, overload training. Um, when did you guys wanna... change? When did you guys change, when did you guys change that? I'm just curious. Yeah. So it used to be called overload underload training was what, what the normal term was okay. that like uh, Dr. Coop de Loren, uh, put out and Tom House put out. And again, that's where it like combines multiple pieces of the training. So then we came out with the term in 2014, we launched super speed of over speed training. And now again, we're trying to talk about that as the differences between over speed training and overload training, but we never really want to go slower. So, uh, you know, like a little shout out to one of my, my buddies in a uh, Philly, Anthony Vatisse. Uh, he's a, uh, we actually refer to him as captain under speed. He tries to get he tries to get everyone to say under speed training in seminars now and then basically shoots me a look and just wants to laugh he wants to laugh That's at funny. me but anyway we're trying to put that I one to bed say it again. we're I trying promise. to put that one to bed but uh over speed overload training is what you refer to it as yeah let's call it again those are two separate things we have two separate categories and i think this yep. goes to what what you were talking about here derek so yep. like if you look at it from a sprinter standpoint there's two different things that we got to look at if we're really trying to improve, you know, how fast somebody can run or how fast someone can swing a club or whatever we're doing. We're looking at the neuromuscular response to the motor program. Okay. So you have a motor program in your brain, sends a signal down your central nervous system that arrives at your muscles and then your muscles respond to that signal. Right. Then there's a feedback mechanism that goes between those muscles in your brain. It basically says, okay, was that, did that happen in what we expected it to happen speed wise or not? Okay, just to oversimplify that in a major way, but looking at that whole like neuromuscular response system. Well, over speed training, the whole idea there is what we're going to do is we're not going to change the motor program. We're going to send the same signal, but we're going to get a faster response from the muscles. All right, so we're, we're kind of tricking the neurological system into moving faster during that same motor program that's moving. Then we have the overload training side. Um, this would be more for, so, so that over speed side is the running downhill part right? The running downhill part is going to get a faster response speed when you're telling that player to run because you have to or you're going to fall over, right? And that's the light clubs in these systems. Then overload side of it would be more of the, I want more motor units in my body to fire when I, when I shoot that motor pattern out. And that would be, you know, the classic example of that because you know, your body has some um, variants with this but like you know if you're in the gym and you ask somebody to do like a, a squat to go down and pick up a kettlebell if that kettlebell weighs two pounds they're not firing every motor unit in their body that they need to possibly go through that motion if it's 200 pounds now all of a sudden a whole bunch more motor units are firing in order to try to lift that that kettlebell so that, that's kind of the idea there so overload training would be take a motion try to make more motor units fire during that motion and then over speed training is the side of we're going to use whatever's firing, but we're just going to try to trick the brain into moving faster because there's some room there that we can move faster with what we've already got. Does that make sense? Yep. Perfect sense. Daisy, you have anything for us? Yeah, I think like the way that I like to describe it when you try and compare it to how it's been used in the sprinting world is um, if you were to use overspeed training in the sprinting world, try and imagine a sprinter running on a slight decline decline let's say it's 20 percent for the sake of it 20 percent decline then 10 percent decline and then slightly uphill right so imagine them running downhill they gain that stride uh, length stride frequency and then they're challenged to maintain that as they go uphill it's the same sort of thing with this training because we start with the light and we finish with the heavy and you're still swinging that heavy one faster than you did your baseline it's because of the lighter clubs that prime the system. So that, that's the best way that I can try and explain it. Instead of having someone uh, for sprint training, you know, run against resistance or you have the bungees that are pulling them backwards, you know, adding weight vests, add, adding weight. Um, you, you take it back and you have them run downhill or pull them towards the target and turn those bungees round. 
then gradually increase the load, you know, not too much and you'll, you'll get the same results. So there, there is a little bit of confusion out there between the, the differences between those two styles of training. And I think the clearest way to clarify it is that with overspeed training, every swing you make is faster than your baseline. Whereas overload training, some of them are slower due to recruitment of more muscle activation. Would you, would you guys categorize this? And, and, and thank you for that, Daisy. Would you guys categorize this? I mean, this is typically submaximal training. Right? I mean, this is not something where you're, you're telling people to implement as much speed as possible, but it's not at, it's at max effort, but it's not anything where you're supposed to get burned out or tired. There's always kind of some gas in the tank. Is that correct? Or is it just swing as hard as you can for three reps type of thing? and then recover so we make sure we can give that optimal effort every every single set. Yeah, I mean, we uh, what we usually tell people during our training, so if they're using our little speed monitors to actually go through the training, we tell them that regardless of which club if they're using, if they see two swings in a row that go down in speed from the previous one, that they Good need enough. to take a little bit of time, yeah. they need to take at least 30 to 45 seconds before they can start again, right? right. Um, so yes, there is a need for a little bit of recovery, but that's how we police it just to be on a really simplistic, practical way when we're talking to you know the hundreds of thousands of people that use this system now. Um, obviously, if you're in the gym and you're working with an athlete, you could probably monitor that more closely and know exactly you know how much break time they would need in between swings to maintain that maximum effort on each one of those reps. The, the point is speed though. Like if yeah. it slows down, you're, you're losing the effect. So you've got to be maintaining those higher speeds. It's less about how much effort you're putting in to get the speed, more about the fact that you're actually getting it. You know, it's funny. There, there's such a, there's such a misconception out there with training. I mean, Derek and I joke around because you have, we were talking about hit training the other day and how maybe hit training in the strength or when I, we say hit training, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, what's, what's high intensity for a sprinter. And what's high intensity for a sprinter and high intensity for someone who's, you know, GPP are two completely different things. And I think the thing where a lot of amateur athletes struggle with, I even see a lot of tour athletes struggle with. I mean, they come in and they understand what the goal is in the back of their head, but they don't understand what that is supposed to feel like. They're always imagining that it's got to be this rocky type approach i can't tell you how many tour players i've worked with where you're leaving a session they want to be dead exhausted and then i have to go into the whole spiel that we know a lot about is that something you guys struggle with with some of your athletes or do you feel like it's much easier because you have a way to quantify it immediately and say look you went a little too much here look at how your numbers dropped we have to stay within the parameters yeah i mean for our stuff it's, it's relatively simple because the protocols are short you know they're only like five or six minutes long so I mean, I've seen people extremely tanked after the 39 swings that happen in our level one protocol because they've really never been exposed to that type of training before and they're just not used to it. It is very taxing. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we haven't seen, generally speaking, when golfers pick up our stuff, they're well more tired than they ever have been from practicing golf or doing things. So we kind of, it's an automatic, you know, success on that end for us. Um, but I totally agree with you. I mean, in general, like people need to understand that they don't need to be just totally dead and gassed at the end of their, their workout to have done a lot of good work for their body. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll add on to that as well. Um, some of the pro, the pro tour players that I've worked with, or, you know, obviously a little bit in a fitter state than your regular amateur. And so the session for them doesn't feel as strenuous as it would for someone who isn't as fit. Um, and so I'd really recommend to, to them, you know, don't do too much. You always find that they go and do more than they should. And they train every day or they double the protocol up because they think, you know, I'm fit, I'm strong. This is going to be good for me. And in fact, that is the only time we hear of athletes slowing down. So if you do too much or if you find yourself doing our level one protocol three times and that totals up to about 98 swings, you'll actually slow down. And that's when, you know, as a coach, you'd say, you step in and say, no, little is more when it comes to this stuff. It's just like yeah. jump training, plyometrics, you know, low reps, um, lots of intervals, let the, you know, everything that needs to replenish, replenish in order for you to optimize your training. Yeah, it's, it's how, so simple. How important is it to measure something like say like don you can a a answer this too but you have the the velocity radar or whatever uh, uh, mm -hmm. you guys use i use a stopwatch or electronic timing how important is it to time and measure velocity so that people see it and how important is it to not let them see it and just focus on technique 
my you, know, I, you want to go first, Don? No, no, no. I want, I want no. to hear your opinion. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, my opinion on it is we see – you can certainly get good effects out of the training if you don't have that feedback during the actual session. But we find that when players do have that feedback, I mean, it's just that much better. Because if I can – and it, here's, here's the good case that happens. Uh, I'm just going to use the golf swing as an example again. You know, I have a player swings in their first swing with the green clubs 110 miles an hour. And then they, like, tense up. They get really kind of aggressive, and they try to swing as hard as they can on the second when it goes down four miles an hour. Okay. And then the next one, you know, they kind of get, they're a little bit less tense and they swing again, it goes up to 112. Like what that player just learned is they just learned what not to do to try to increase speed and power in their golf swing. And that, that's in some ways more important than even feeling exactly what it was that they did right. So I think that's a big key is it's that, that feedback that they're able to get so they can kind of go through that self-discovery learning in the protocols that you know, gets back to my point of the coaching of this is that I'm not trying to coach the mechanics of the golf swing. I'm trying to help this player get, get, get better in speed and power, which may have a lot of cool effects that'll help the mechanics of their golf swing, but I never want them thinking about that. All I want them thinking about is making that thing move as fast as they can and figuring out what they need to do to make that happen. And you will always see positive results happen with the efficiency of their golf swing when that speed number goes up. You know, and any golfer that says they don't want to see the numbers, they're full of shit. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many I've worked with in the past where they'll, they'll, oh, no, I don't want to look at the numbers and I'm more of a feel person. And, you know, they dive into the numbers a little bit and they're like, really? Let me, let me, let me get some more good feedback like that. I think it only helps. I, I think, listen, you're just gaining a little bit more knowledge about your swing, about your body. Um, I think it's allowing you to prepare a lot better. I think it's allowing you to train a lot smarter. I mean, I keep bringing up Rory, but because of, you know, specific things he's used with HRV and, you know, and smart training, um, you know, he's actually began to, he's, he trains great and, 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 what, and what he's doing for his body, he's not overdoing it and he's not, his body feels better and he's taking a great approach to what he needs to be doing. So um, I think in the long run, it only helps out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like uh, when you're young, Don, and you try to pick up women on the subway. Like you've got instant feedback, right? So oh yeah, it's a slap in the face all the time. Sorry, <laughs> Davey. very rude. <laughs> hey, only one's got to say yes, right? It's about yeah, exactly. a numbers yeah. game. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank God I found the right one already. So I'm I'm done with that. Part. Same here. My wife's actually. If you heard any of the background noise, there, she's hosting a. Uh, Halloween party this morning for like 25 kids upstairs. So that, that's well, what's going on in, Thanks place. for the invite, man. We really <laughs> we could have done it. Sorry, year. I locked myself in my office in my basement. We're, it, we're coming as it up and then <laughs> we're coming as superheroes. Yeah. Oh, definitely, Daisy. <laughs> Daisy, uh, you know we and we weren't really formally introduced, but can you give us a little bit of your background? Yeah. So I'm a ACSM certified exercise physiologist. Uh, I spent. Um, I did my master's degree at West Florida. Uh, exercise science and I did some research using um, the body track force and pressure mat and using super speed so what I was doing was testing them using 3d biomechanics you know Vicon all the 16 um, cameras and all that good stuff and um, so leading on from that I got a position with super speed and my role is director of education and so what I do is I help coaches um, to understand the science behind and the applications behind the coaching side of this um, I've created this online certification with uh, the guys from Superspeed. Um, again, just providing lots of education out, um, to all the coaches and players out there. Also develop the protocols as well. So, you know, testing yeah. those drills to make sure they're good for you before we implement them and, and all that good stuff. So, I'm yeah. curious, what do you guys use for kinematic sequencing over there? Uh, I mean, all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, I'm like an old school AMM 12 guy. So like I had one of those systems back in 2009 when I started my golf Academy business that, you know, we still use that today and use that for a lot of our testing. The um, Cheatham brothers, right? Did they, uh, I, yeah. I bought my, I bought my first system from them back in 2005 and I think yep. it was a four sensor system or a six sensor. Yep. I can't remember. It was so old, but. So I was actually, I knew Phil pretty well. I, first got into the golf business out in Scottsdale and actually um, was with him a few of his like old uh, AMM certification programs that he did um, uh, out at API in Phoenix back in the day. So mm -hmm. yeah, I've, I've been around those guys for, for a long time. Uh, really, really smart, smart people. Right. Um, 
obviously now we've we've moved on to using kvest a lot and some of the other systems that are out there that are a little bit faster and easier to to go about it but yeah i mean i still like i i have a soft spot for uh AMM 12 for sure. We actually yeah. just got some really cool data on AMM 12. We were at a uh, um, we were at a facility called uh, Planet Fast Pitch up in Boston. Um, Denise Davis runs that, so we were actually getting some uh, some kinematic sequence data on um, fast pitch softball players. Um, that is some really really cool stuff. So there's some really neat things that happen in that motion that are are certainly very explosive and very powerful. So yeah, man. What are some of the, what are some of the other sports that you that you, I mean we've been talking a lot about golf but mm -hmm. God I mean it's just so many of the same principles apply for all speed sports correct so some what are some you just said fast pitch softball what are some of the other sports that you guys are diving into yeah so uh, baseball softball definitely came out about two years ago um, we're looking we just launched tennis so tennis is out now too uh, we partnered with uh, Jeff Salzenstein uh, who's also one of the lead instructors for Racket Fit. Uh, really, really cool program there. So Super Speed Tennis is the name of that product. Um, we have protocols that work obviously on overspeed training to increase racket speed and help people, you know, create more power and speed in tennis. Um, we've done some really neat stuff in, in combination with Jeff though. So the protocols, we have three protocols that are more similar to what we have for golf and baseball or the overspeed training. But then we have three really cool protocols for tennis that work on specific aspects of the game. So we have a protocol that is primarily about maintaining racket speed when you're moving laterally on the court, one where you're moving defensively on the court and one where you're moving transitionally. So uh, we in implemented a lot of Jeff's different footwork patterns that he works on with players to try to really help people optimize their speed in different areas of the court, not just when they're hitting a static forehand or a serve. Um, we're actually looking into lacrosse. Uh, we're looking in uh, the Irish hurling team is actually testing some of our stuff right now. Uh, we're looking into cricket. Um, hockey's always been kind of on one that we've, we've thought about getting into as well. So yeah, I mean, any sport where you're swinging an object essentially is something where we, we feel like we can make a really big impact on speed and power. Have you guys you used a lot of um, force plate testing just to see what's happening on the ground relative to the different weights and loads and all that yeah so that was actually one of the so daisy's story just to kind of uh, say that in a little really easy way she was actually in grad school and she found us and said look i want to do i want to do my master's thesis on some like data on ground reaction force for, and and the super speed club so she found us back when she was still in school and did you know a whole project on looking at ground reaction force and, and things and then we hired her after she got out of school um recently we've been doing some a good bit of testing with uh, the guys at swing catalyst um scott lynn's had a lot of his a lot of players have been coming through his lab, going through our stuff and looking at it. We've seen some huge jumps. And uh, we just did a level two certification course uh, out in Vegas with them. And I mean, we had a player increase vertical force by like 18% in five minutes going through our, our program and a couple of our drills that we do with super speed. Wow. So absolutely, yes. Uh, I mean, we know that ground reaction force is going to increase. And it, the, the only thing that is difficult to talk about is, like I said, every player is different. If you have a player that doesn't use the ground well at all and they go through our training, they're definitely going to get better. You might have a player, though, that does use the ground pretty well, so you may not see as big of a percentage jump for that player. So uh, it's harder to talk about than the ending swing speed, you know, but uh, absolutely we've, we've done a lot of that. And Daisy can probably talk about some of her project, too, with more specific ground reaction force details. Daisy, I had a question. Um, do you ever see someone's improvement go in the reverse direction, um, even if they're uh, doing all the things they need to be doing from a training standpoint? Just say stress or um, I, I think everyone's trying to always point the finger at an exercise or a training type. I mean, I know I, we have a member this morning that I was talking to and the guy just needs to go on vacation for seven days. He's, he's just absolutely, no, and, it's a, and you laugh at it, but he's I know that guy. Yeah, no, but he's, <laughs> he's legitimately fried and you can just see it. Um, there's, there's nothing wrong with his body. I mean, he's, he's obviously broken down and, and he's weak, but you know, if you were to run his whole body through an MRI scan right now, we've had enough tests on him to know that he's fine. But um, just the level of stress and the level of the fact that he just – it just go, 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 go. So are you ever dealing with athletes like that that are just overdoing it and you're starting to see their performance diminish? Um, how do you deal with that? And, 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 yes. and have you seen it? Yeah, so it falls back to what I was saying earlier about them thinking that they should do more. Normally that's the only time when we see um, them decline. 
Um, mm. We don't really see anyone decline if they go through our system, you know, correctly. But um, another thing that comes into play is like chemical stress in the body. So just things that the environment's causing, whether it's your diet, the amount of sleep that you're getting, um, and that all falls into the pool of recovery. Um, so I think that, you know, if you do, you know, get 15 to 20 weeks into training and you notice a, a small decline, there might be some other things that you should be doing in order to take that governor off and let your body move, which number one, it could be chemical stress, sort your diet out, sort your daily routine out, you know, um, get your cells on a, on a better level to repair. Sleep's um, a huge one. Sleep is, yeah, sleep is huge. Yeah, um, but uh, sometimes it's not that simple. And that's like, you know, sometimes it's like, all right, we're, we're trying to work on sleep, we're improving meditation, and there's just other variables that just, for some reason, people just can't lock down. It's not always like, oh, let's sleep. And the specific things with, with, with gut health you guys ever looking into or Absolutely. Things yeah. the brain function that you're ever able to dive in on? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I can just give you my own personal story recently. Yeah. I mean, these last few years, like probably these last three years, I mean, I've been on the road at least 30 to 40 weeks a year the last couple of years, like, yeah. you know, out, you know, speaking about super speed, um, you know, we sponsor over half of the PGA sections in the U.S., all five zones in Canada, the LPGA nationally, and then now we got about four or five different federations over in Europe as well. So, I mean, I'm out doing workshops and talks and things about this all the time. And, um, you know, just pretty recently, uh, probably somebody you know too, but I live in Denver now. So I actually uh, mm -hmm. called up a buddy of mine named D. Tidwell. So, you know, old, old school Czech guy too. I was like, all right, look, here's the deal. Like, you know, my life has gotten to a point where it's hard to manage because I'm out at all these things. I'm traveling so much. It's harder to pick good options on food. It's harder to get enough sleep and all that. I was like, I need to come up with a plan. And, you know, we sat down together and really worked out like, okay, so, you know, here's the type of things you need to do. You got to make sure that we're going to sleep this much when you're on those trips. And, you know, we know that there's this equipment in these different hotel gyms and you're going to carve out time. And these are the exercises you're going to do. And I mean, that's changed my world around over this summer. But I think that's the big picture there. It's not about any one of the variables. I think it's about dialing in the entire plan of that lifestyle, no matter what you have to do, whether it's you're on the road 40 weeks a year, or you've got, you know, kids that are demanding or whatever it might be. I think coming up with that comprehensive plan that takes all of those aspects and tries to improve every one of them in some way, I think makes a huge difference in, in people's overall health. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just had one final question just about, um, you know, everybody's about quick fixes, like we're just talking about like, oh, I got to sleep better. But um, how do you dissuade people from going like, oh, I want to try this overspeed uh, uh, or lower loading program. And it's like, well, why don't we just work on your swing first? Like, let's just do the basics first before going to that when do you guys jump in and make sure that somebody understands like we've got to work on some fundamentals before we get to these finer points? I'd actually go the other way. So I'd say I'd rather somebody work with our system first. Okay. Cause that's going to get in their mind about how do I create speed and power? How do I be athletic making this club move down through the hitting zone? And then I think what, if you can start with that base, I'd always rather start with a player that, understands how they need to move their body to make the club move in a, in a powerful way. And then we can work on all the more fine motor skill type things with face control, ball control, all the other things that we need to do to play golf. Well, um, you know, we look at that, whether it's juniors or adults, I'm always trying to build an athlete first and then apply that athleticism to the specific sports skills that we need to be able to excel in that sport. I think a big there, thing there, Mike oh, is, um, so I think a big thing there is that we don't require contact, which a lot of the times when someone's learning the sport, it can deter them from um, good mechanics. And so that's one thing that we feel is a benefit to our system. Um, if you're just starting to do these sports, you know, it's a good way to learn. It helps increase rotational velocities, which just helps sequencing and it will help you mechanically in the long run, just by swinging it as hard as you can, not really know what you're doing technically. Is there any value in going super slow? Like remember like the karate guy, like, <laughs> you know, to tracing the movement is there any value in that ah that's a good question um the only real research that i've seen on that would be where we're starting to look at like mirror neuron training you know so i think a lot of swimmers have done some of that stuff um and and other other sports i mean there definitely is science coming that there's some types of those types of like repetitive sort of motions that can imprint in the brain in a certain way and help you to learn things without 
really going through a lot of the normal process of motor learning. Um, from an, an athletic skill standpoint, though, at least what we're dealing with in golf, um, again, I'm not going to discount it. I know there's some research there that's coming, and I think some of that virtual reality, augmented reality type training could be some of the future of how human beings learn a lot of different things and can bypass a lot of that normal motor learning process. But, you know, right now with that not being kind of on the forefront yet, you know, I definitely always think it's important to build athletic efficiency, teach people how to sequence those sort of things first, and then apply it to the more specific skills. Awesome. awesome. I love it. Yeah. Where, where do we find out more info? Uh, <laughs> yeah, website, so, social media? Absolutely. So all of our social media platforms are at Superspeed Golf, at Superspeed Slugger, at Superspeed Tennis. Uh, websites, exactly the same. So superspeedgolf.com, superspeedslugger.com, superspeedtennis.com. Also check out, if you really want to learn more information, we do have that online certification program called Superspeed Certified. Uh, that's at superspeedcertified.com. So you can also get there from our main website. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're, we're always here too. So, you know, shoot, shoot us stuff on social media or or uh, email at info at superspeedgolf.com. We can always get back with any more specific questions. Um, you know, we're here to help. We're, we, we try to be, I would say, sharers of information and trying to get more good information out to players and coaches to help them get better more efficiently. And that's one of our, our major goals uh, as a business with Superspeed. All right. Well, guys, well, we, there, there it is. Michael Napoleon and Daisy Kenny with Superspeed. Um, and that is, I'm not going to say under speed training. I'm going to say over, um, over speed, overload training. What Let's just say? go over speed training. That's all over we need. Speed training. That's <laughs> all we need. Good guys. Thank you so much. It was great having you on. Um, let's, let's keep in touch. If you guys up in New York, I'd love to stop by again. And uh, it'd, be, it'd be great to see each other in person. Absolutely done. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Great well. meeting you. Thanks. Thanks Take thanks care. Bye-bye.